developing, which is fantastic. We need better evidence resources to make it easier for people to look up that information. What David Sackett was doing was actually brilliant, but in using very primitive tools. We, we've got much better tools now, and I'm sure they'll continue to get better. The literature is also improving. We know more about the methods of doing EBM, the user guide series, etc. Um, things have evolved to make it easier for us to read, the structured abstract, the consort statement to present control trials. Um, the grade group has been working on trying to classify evidence more clearly to get beyond just the simple levels of evidence um, that we use of randomised trial, cohort study, etc. to look, look at it in a more fine-grained way. There are areas that have been neglected. We've recently been working on evidence-based monitoring. So a lot of tests get done for diagnostic purposes, but actually probably about one-third of all testing is for monitoring purposes. And that monitor, evidence-based monitoring has been a neglected field despite being one of the fastest growing areas of testing. And there's a big interest in knowledge translation, and this is Sharon Strauss's recent book on the area as well. So things are evolving. And it's been specified now as, part, as, a, uh, as an appropriate curriculum to be part of medicine, that we should train um, healthcare students generally in this. So there was the Sicily statement. There's a regular meeting in Sicily. And the curriculum was basically formulated around the four steps of EBM, <coughs> formulate an answerable question, track down the best evidence, critically appraise that, and integrate the decision with your expertise and the patient's values. Unfortunately, it's not necessarily happening everywhere. It's very patchy in the, in the degree of training around the world. We did a survey of UK medical schools and got 20 replies of, from 32 medical schools. A lot of them didn't have somebody who, was, who could tell us about what the EBM curriculum was. So we couldn't find a person who was in charge of it. Uh, so this is, this is an, uh, an optimistic view in a way, because I, I, my guess is that the others are worse. These are the things like being able to search databases, appraise therapy articles, understand confidence intervals and p-values. As you can see, most of the topics, at least the main ones, get covered, but actually there's very little practice in them. Okay, most of the medical, only about half the medical schools do some practice in these and it's much more rarely assessed. Okay, so there's, it seems like there's a sort of superficial coverage, but not actually training in the practical skills of EBM at the moment, and it's patchy. Some medical schools, I must say, were absolutely superb, and there are others where, where the term was a bit foreign to them. And it'll be a, a generation or two, I think, before we've really moved to it being considered just part of, you know, it's just, it's just like having a stethoscope. You, know, you just wouldn't think of practicing medicine without a stethoscope. In, in 20 years' time, you won't think of doing it without understanding what evidence is all about. Anne McKibben, who works at McMaster, did this interesting study as part of her PhD where she looked at people um, in general practice or in internal medicine. She gave them a set of questions to answer, said, what do you think the answer to these are? Then she said, OK, now do a search. See if you can find an answer, some, some information about that. And then re-ask them the questions. OK, now what do you think about that? To see whether it would improve their answers. So in 28% of cases, they went from right to right. 13% of cases, they went from wrong to right. They corrected their answer. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is that right to wrong was 11%. In other words, people could look up stuff, get misled by information, and get the wrong answer because of their, like, you know, they looked up Google and found some trash website and, and were misled by it. And the other disappointing part is the wrong to wrong. That's not quite as disappointing. I think it's the balance between these two that overall there was a 2% improvement by doing a search. A couple of similar studies have been done. One is a group in um, New South Wales in Australia. Um, Enrico Correa's group developed a system called Quick Clinical, which was an interface to try and guide you to the best um, information to look at. It would go through guidelines. Um, systematic reviews, um, to PubMed using the clinical queries filters that I'll show you, etc. And that, this was just with GPs, and they did a bit better. 32% went from wrong to right, and only 7% went from right to wrong. Okay, and 40% still went from wrong to wrong. So at least here there was a, a substantial improvement in the number correct, which is great. So I think Quick Clinical is actually a very good system. But are we there yet? No. They still took minutes to do this and 
40% of them are still going from wrong to wrong. So there's still a lot of room for improvement in terms of either training people or improving the interfaces. And I'm, I'm not sure it would be nice if we could just do it through the interfaces somehow. We found search engines that could make this easy. A couple of other studies by Hirsch and Hirsch, these were both by Hirsch on, on medical students and nurses. Um, and again, um, a little better than with the, with the McKibben study, but they probably had more room for improvement here. They were basically getting more wrong in the first place. One of the problems in all of this is just so much research is actually poor. So for the EBM journal, we scan 140 journals, primary journals, and get about 60,000 articles per year and ask some simple questions about whether, as a first screen about whether these articles are valid in these journals. For an intervention, we need, the study needs to be randomised and have at least 80% follow-up. That's it. Okay. For a prognosis study, it has to be an inception, inception cohort. The rules are actually a relatively low bar. This isn't the full-scale critical appraisal. This is a low bar, 5% pass that stage. And then we do a test on relevance. We ask people about, would this be important to change your practice, etc. And we actually filter down to a very small number of things that we actually pick up for the EBM journal. But the consequence is that the number needed to read to find one valid article is about 20 which means most issues of won't, most journals won't contain a single valid article. And the number needed to read to find a valid and relevant article is about 200. So you have to do a lot of reading. So actually, I mean, one of the purposes of journals like EBM is to help you with that scanning process. Finding stuff is good. We need to be able to peer review it as well. And unfortunately, our peer review system isn't particularly good. So we should, you, you imagine that the good stuff goes into these journals and the rest goes into the bias and confounding trash can. Unfortunately, that's not true. One of the most cynical studies I've ever seen was Sarah Schroeter's. Where, and when, how this passed the ethics committee, I don't know. They got 607 reviewers of the BMJ and they inserted errors into the papers and sent them out <coughs> without telling the reviewers just to see whether they detected the errors or not. These 14 errors, nine they classified as major and, three, and um, five minor errors. And on average, less than three of the nine major errors were detected. And unfortunately, our peer reviewers at the moment are not trained properly in critical appraisal. They don't know how to detect the bad things from the good things. The last area I wanted to mention was the application. I think this is probably the biggest one that we have to work on over the next couple of decades. And that's, we've got great systematic reviews now, that's all happening in Cochrane, um, but there's a real problem in the application of the results to individual patients, and there's a couple of areas. One is taking the average result and finding out what it means for the individual, but the other is the how to do it. The ways to individualise, I think you can think of in, in several different areas. In chronic diseases, you can do a single patient trial or monitoring and adjustment. In acute disease, you've got to try and predict it and adjust for um, the, the predictive tools and finally in prevention you've got to predict the future risk. The people at high risk basically have more to gain than the people at low risk. I'm not going to go through that one in detail because that's a sort of whole talk by itself but I'd recommend this very good book that Peter Rothwell has put together on treating individuals which goes through looking at very different slices of this whole problem. Um, Peter's a neurologist here in Oxford um, and it's a very good compilation of essays that were originally in the um, Lancet and there's an extended version of them that's in the book. The other one I said that I wanted to talk a bit more about was the idea of, um, of what the treatment is. I'm just going to give you an example of this. This was a, a paper that featured recently in the BMJ on long-term benefits of reduced salt intake. We'd known for a long time that reducing your salt um, leads to lower blood pressure, but we'd never been, no one had been able to prove that it actually improved cardiovascular outcomes. And this trial, the TORCH trial, did. Oh, sorry, the top study did. Here's the description of the, patient, of the sodium reduction though, that was in this paper. Individual and weekly group counselling sessions were offered initially with less intensive counselling and support thereafter specific to sodium reduction. So I want you to try and imagine what you would be telling a patient next Monday if you wanted to advise them about salt reduction. Picture the sorts of things you're going to do with them based on this information. We were trying to track this down, so we tracked through the references in the papers was one of, one of the ways that we tracked this down. And here's the fuller description that's in a 
Um, a journal you have to pay for, by the way, so this is not free information. The BMJ research article is free because they make all their research articles free. But here it said this was an individual session followed by 10 weekly group 90 minute sessions with a nutritionist followed by a transitional stage of some additional sessions. Topics in the weekly sessions included getting started, sodium basics, the morning meal, midday sources of sodium, the main meal, planning ahead, creative cooking, eating out, food cues and social support. The sessions included sampling of foods, discussion of articles on sodium reduction and problem solving and patients kept diaries at least six days a week and urine sodiums were measured. Did anyone imagine all of those? <laughs> Oh, did anyone imagine even half of them? <laughs> you probably wouldn't have, so you couldn't pick this up from that description. And even this, I mean, first of all, it sounds impractical. This is not something I'm going to be doing in general practice next Monday. But even if I was absolutely dedicated to this, I couldn't replicate this without getting hold of the manuals and seeing a lot more about how this whole process actually runs. So this is not a replicable intervention. It's a nice proof of concept, if you like, but it's not actually something you should pick up on. The editor of the BMJ had actually written